Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming to the first session, the first workshop called Beyond Diversity. My name is Doug Osborne and I'm on the planning team. And on behalf of the whole planning team, I just want to say thanks so much for being here and a huge thanks to our main sponsor, which is the University of Alaska Southeast Title III grant. They have put so much effort into this. So thanks to Leah and Barb and everybody at UAS SICA campus for making this happen. So I'm calling in from Zoom in my office in, uh, in, in, from Search, which is in Sitka. So for our land acknowledgement, we're going to do the land acknowledgement that is often used here in Sitka. And it's one that was used at last year's Indigenous Peoples Day. And Lori's going to put this in the chat. One of the things we hoped for is that people might cut and paste these words and use it uh, locally as they are starting events, a really respectful way to start. So we just want to start by recognizing that we're on Hlinkit Ani, and Ani is a Hlinkit word for land, and Hlinkit people have been in this place for over 10,000 years. It's important to recognize this historical fact, but it's also important to recognize that the Hlinkit people have been excellent stewards of this special place and have lived out traditional tribal values around balance, respect, and caring for the earth that sustains us all. So for taking such wonderful care of this place, uh, for time immemorial, we say thank you and gushtish. So today's workshop, the first of several, goes from 10 until noon. We are gonna take a five minute break in the middle where you'll be able to get up and stretch. It's gonna be recorded for educational purposes. As a participant in the chat box, you can send a question and at the end, Tim, our, our speaker, will have a chance to answer questions maybe the last 10 minutes. So if something comes up, just type in the chat and you'll see it'll say ask a question. That's who you send it to. So to send it to ask a question, that'll go to our, our Zoom host uh, and conductor Leah Mason and then she's going to send it to Dr. Kraft and Tina and then we'll, they'll synthesize and we'll be able to ask a few questions at the end. So this is the first of five uh, speakers and we're so excited to have uh, Tim with us and here to do an introduction is somebody who's been on the planning team who did the decolonization workshop I mentioned at Indigenous Peoples Day and has been involved in this work for years like Tim as well. My fellow uh, search health educator Lakota Harden is here to do a intro for Tim. So thanks for being here Lakota. Good morning everybody and it's really good to see so many people's familiar names. Um, all of you have been making that commitment to, decol to decolonize to make Sitka a better place. So um, I first want to start off by just um, acknowledging our ancestors and the ancestors of this land, giving thanks for the time that we're in. Uh, we are in a time of purification. The earth herself is purifying herself. We're seeing fires and this orange smoke over most of the West Coast and all kinds of things, the earthquakes, the floods, everything that's happening. So we want to give thanks for our time, for our bodies, for our minds, for our spirits, for our families, for all these things, and um, always um, acknowledging those who came before us, on which the earth, the path that we walk, and all of you have been doing some really good work in trying to um, remember the original instructions and to decolonize our minds and ourselves. And with that, um, I want to acknowledge Tim as a friend. We've known each other for a few decades more than we probably want to admit, um, but we're both on this path. And I think that when the energy that you put out um, is what you attract. And I think that both of us and Tim specifically has committed his life to this work to helping the human race in being and remembering what it is to be a human being. Uh, Tim's story goes way back to his childhood where he first started to see that the discrepancies and what was happening and the mistreatment of people who didn't look like himself. And from that, that point on, he, um, his family, his whole life has been about uh, making change in this world so that everybody is respected, everybody is um, accounted for, everybody is um, treated well. And he's worked on that as an ally to people of color, as an ally to differently abled people, as an ally to young people, to gay, lesbian, bisexual people, to anybody that's been mistreated. He has um, 
dedicated his work to that. He's written over eight books. He's traveled everywhere around the world as well as um, virtually, you know, every now and then you'll see him on CNN or someplace um, as an expert. Um, so he has accolades and you can read about it. But for me, what I want to say about Tim is he was doing land acknowledgements 20 years ago. Um, he was making sure that everybody is treated fairly 30 years ago, you know, so I, I, this has been a hard commitment for him. And he even um, sort supports his, through his speaking, and this is how we got him through Speak Out, which is one of the um, agencies that help bring the unheard voices to the forefront. And he has committed to keep supporting them. Um, so part of his income always goes to supporting the agencies and the companies around him that are helping people as well. So he puts his money where his mouth is also, which is a rare thing. And uh, he's really been on the forefront of this. So Tim, a father, a son, a brother, a friend to many, we're really grateful and thankful that you have come here to our little island, our big island um, with a small mighty community that has really committed themselves to doing the work. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much, Lakota. It is, uh, it's an honor to be introduced by you. It is an honor to be with all of you uh, here today. I'm coming to you from my home in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, which is, of course, the historic ancestral land of Cherokee, Choctaw, and Chickasaw indigenous peoples um, who were, in most uh, cases, extirpated and removed from this land uh, to make way for those like my own ancestors who came here and took that land quite unceremoniously and moved others out. It is also land uh, upon which black bodies labored for hundreds of years uh, without proper acknowledgement, let alone recompense for their labor. So both from the land acknowledgement and also labor acknowledgement perspective, I'm very mindful of, of this place uh, from which I come to you. I wish that I could be with you there in person, had been looking forward uh, to this event more than most. You know, I mean, I love going and, and meeting people anywhere that I get to go, but I will say that I was, of all the events that I had planned for this uh, fall semester of, of school, uh, I really was looking forward to this one most of all. Number one, of course, to be able to see my dear friend Lakota, but also to come to your beautiful part of the world and, and share some time with you. Um, but I'm still honored to be able to do that virtually because it is virtual, I want, and because I'm a 52-year-old man with no technological skills to speak of, I want to, before I really get started, issue a warning, sort of a disclaimer, that there is every possibility that I could get really excited. I speak with my hands, so I could hit a button on my computer, I could knock my microphone over, I could accidentally disconnect myself from the internet. Any of these things are possible. And as a 52 year old man with no technical skills, I'm gonna to have to go get my 17 year old who's in virtual classes as a junior in high school to come fix it. So if anything happens, just know it's not on your end. You have technological geniuses working this on your end and then you got me and literally anything could happen. Um, but I'm gonna hope that it doesn't because in the last couple of months I've done a bunch of these events and they've usually gone pretty well. I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed. Um, as I said, it is an honor to be with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of one thing in particular in this moment that's so important um, that I wouldn't have anticipated saying, because when we first began to plan this event, I don't think that any of us really knew that we would be in the middle of really what is, throughout this country, the largest uh, racial justice uprising really in the history of the nation. I'm just talking about in pure numbers of people in large and small towns all across the country in all 50 states uh, who are standing up for racial justice in one way or another. And, um, and because we're in that moment, I think it's valuable for us to reflect on why we're in that moment and sort of what that means. Because if there's anything positive to come from the tragedy of this global pandemic and this public health crisis that we're facing with COVID-19, um, not that there could be anything positive about that, but you know, if we're going to try to redeem this moment in our own lives and in the history of our of our society, um, we have to ask these difficult questions. If we're gonna if we're going to make sense of the violence meted out on black and brown bodies all across this country, whether that's by law enforcement or by the forces of colonialism and imperialism historically, or whether it's the forces of indigenous removal or 
caging children at the border, coming across uh, the southern border of the United States, whatever it is, uh, we're going to have to ask these questions um, about why it is that in this moment we're seeing this uprising. It's very heartening on the one hand to see so many people, whether it's you know spilling into the streets or asking these questions, how do I get involved? How do I make a difference? How do we undo racism? How do we undo this legacy of white supremacy? Um, and I think we have to have a very clear sense of why that's happening now, because if we don't have a clear sense of it, I'm afraid we may not be able to sustain that push and, and really begin to undo and, and, and unravel these systems of oppression and inequality. Uh, whether we call that white supremacy, whether we call that colonialism, whether we call that imperialism, or whether we call that all part of the same thing, uh, we have to ask ourselves why right now. Because, you know, it's true that so much of the pain that people are expressing right now whether it's in the movement for Black Lives or whether it's in the movement for immigrant justice uh, or whether it's in the environmental justice and, and environmental racism, anti-environmental racism efforts. Um, all of that is, is, is a cry that has been voiced for a very long time. There's nothing really new about this in the sense that we've just now discovered that police violence toward Black and Brown peoples is a serious problem or that we've just now discovered the inequities of wealth and housing and education um, and, and income. Uh, those things have been around for a long time, right? They predate this presidential administration. And I dare say they're going to exist no matter what happens in November, because these are problems that are deeply embedded in the soil and the soul of this country. So why is it that in this moment, we suddenly have people who have never really been that animated on this issue, getting animated? Um, and I think the reason is precisely because we are in this pandemic moment where the sort of virtual lockdown that most of America has been in for the last five or six months, being, you know, more indoors than normal, perhaps not socializing as much, not going to work in the same way, doing things virtually rather than in person has given us, I mean, it's been horribly frustrating, I'm sure for, for most of us, right, to, to have that um, happen. But at the same, and it's been scary for those of us who have chronic health conditions and worry, obviously, about ourselves, our loved ones. Um, but it's also provided us with a certain quiet, right? A certain um, space to sit with the things that we see on the news and the things that we hear about. And because we're not going about the regular bustle and hustle of our lives, right? The sort of regular day to day routine, which is a lot of noise and a lot of stuff happening, we're in a, a more a more quiet, reflective space, I think that has actually given us the opening to see things that perhaps many people previously didn't see, to hear things that perhaps we didn't hear or that we you know, put on the noise canceling headphones so that we didn't have to hear, uh, and allowing us to feel things that we didn't feel before. You know, when George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis and Derek Chauvin put his knee on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, that wasn't the first time that we had seen a video of a black man being killed on film by a uh, agent of the state. Uh, Eric Garner was choked out on the streets of Staten Island, New York. Um, uh, uh, Philando Castile, we saw the aftermath of his shooting on film also in and around uh, the Twin Cities a few years ago. Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, John Crawford III outside of Dayton a few years ago. All of those killings captured on film and yet they didn't lead to this level of uprising. And so I think there's something about this pandemic moment and the tragedy of it and the, the, the being locked down that has created this space. If that is true, then we have an obligation to take advantage of that opening. I, don't, I hate the language of take advantage of. I should say that open window is one we have to go through if we are going to make sense of this moment and turn this tragedy of 190 some odd thousand deaths so far from COVID, as well as the deaths lost, the lives lost to police violence, if we're gonna make sense of that and turn the corner from that and really undo systems of racial oppression and domination, then we have to take this opening that we have and ask the important questions so that we can come up with the important answers. Um, because this isn't just a movement that in the long run is gonna be about policing. And it's not just a movement that's about anti-blackness. As central as anti-blackness has been to the system of white supremacy and as central as policing has been to the project of anti-blackness, this moment is not just about that. 
it is also a moment for us to examine the larger structures of racism and white supremacy and the impacts of that on indigenous peoples and all peoples of color because all of it flows from the same source, right? If you think of white supremacy as the mouth of the river, so to speak, everything that flows from the mouth of the river downstream is toxic and it will poison the soil and it will poison the water upon which we all depend. We may be poisoned differently, right? We may not be poisoned in exactly the same way, um, but we are all being poisoned by the effluent that is flowing, uh, if you will, downstream from the mouth of that river. And so to effectively challenge racism, privilege, and inequality, which is the subtitle of my work with you today, this sort of session with you today, there are a few things that we have to do. And they're critical things. And none of them are easy. And the reason it's important to say that is that, you know, since this uprising began, the most recent iteration and version of this uprising. Um, there have been a lot of people, God bless them, you know, love them, they're wonderful, who are asking these questions. How do we get involved? What do we do? How do we fix this? And on the one hand, I, I love to hear those questions because it demonstrates, I, I think, compassion and concern and a willingness to engage, but it also concerns me. And I think it concerns any of us who've been at this for a while, because if all of a sudden you're asking all those questions, I start to wonder if you want your answers sort of hand delivered to you on a silver platter, like a PowerPoint presentation, right? Do you, do you ask those questions so that someone can give you the solution the way that I might give you an aspirin if you have a headache or the way that you might go get plastic surgery if you think your nose is too big? Oh, that's a quick fix. Let me just go do that. Or, you know, let me take this pill for this or that pill for this. Or, you know, let me, let me drink some caffeine in the morning so I can wake up. These are all easy fixes that we're very used to as a culture. Um, and so we look for the, for the fast solution. And I worry when I see corporations and government agencies and even nonprofits or individuals who were saying, what do we do? What do we do? I feel like, you know, I, I don't want to be cynical, but I do worry that we're thinking of this as a problem that, you know, we can fix if you just give us the one, two, three. Well, the reality is that's actually a very white Western way of thinking about this problem of colonialism, imperialism, white supremacy, the domination and subordination of people based on color and culture. Um, and, and faith background and nationality and all of that. It's a very white Western way to view it, to think, well, there's a problem and by God, we'll solve it, right? Because when you have privilege and power, relatively speaking, um, in a society, you do sort of have the luxury, don't you, of thinking, well, if there's a problem, there must be a solution. And if the solution to a headache is an aspirin, then by God, the solution to racism must be out there. Let me just, you know, we'll just get our heads together and we'll talk about it and we'll figure it out. Um, but that's not the way this problem works. It has taken hundreds of years in this place that we call the United States. Going back to before it was called that, 400 years at least um, to actually develop white supremacy to the extent that we have developed it in what we now call the United States. More than half a millennia of colonialism and imperialism and the theft of indigenous land in the Americas to get to this point. So if you have a problem that is half a millennia old, at least, right, then the idea that we're going to come up with a solution in a, in a, in a few months of uprising or that even a lot of really brilliant people putting their heads together can come up with a solution in a matter of a few years is incredibly unlikely. And let me be very clear. Um, you know, I have a healthy ego formation. I think it's good for all of us to have a healthy ego formation, but I don't think that I have the answers to these problems. I am 52 years old. I'm a white man from Nashville, Tennessee. There are black and brown people who have been trying to find the answers for undoing white supremacy for hundreds of years, really and truly, what are the odds that this guy, this, this 52 year old white man from Nashville suddenly has discovered the holy grail that those black and brown people have not discovered yet? Very, very unlikely, but I do know the questions to ask. And I think I know some of the themes that we ought to explore if we want to come up with the answer collectively, because that's the thing. If you're trying to undo a collective problem, right? You can't look to individuals, no matter how smart or how expert people say they are, we have to come to those solutions collectively in community and in discussion with one another. And I'm afraid that some of this 
really fast burn, high burn energy of the last several months doesn't always avail itself of that reality, right? It's much more about give me the PowerPoint, give me the one through five, I'll plug that in and we'll move on to the next thing. When in fact, this is lifelong work that we're engaged in trying to undo racism. So what are the things we have to do that are, that are more long-term projects that you can do, that, that we here in Nashville can do, that people all around the United States and, and really in any country, I would say this is good advice when you're dealing with systems of oppression, uh, what we can do to undo those systems. The first thing, and again, like I said, these aren't easy. If they were easy, we would have done them. Uh, the first thing is we have to develop a willingness to truly honor historical memory. And this is something we don't talk a lot about in this culture. It's very important. You know, when you, when you ask high school students, and I have now a freshman in college, which I'm sure Lakota hearing that is going to just like, you know, fall out of her chair because I'm about to fall out of mine. She knows when my kids were not even on this earth yet or when they were very young, certainly not 19 and 17, which they are now. But I have one who's a freshman in college and one who's a junior in, in high school. And when you ask high school students, not necessarily mine, Mine are a little different because they grew up in my home, right? But you ask most high school students, what was your least favorite class in high school? And overwhelmingly, the answer that most people will give is history. They hated history. Now, I was a history geek. I loved it, but I didn't like it in school because I didn't like the way it was taught. It was sort of boring, but I enjoyed it on my own and I would explore it on my own. And that was just because of the family I grew up in. They had that interest, but most people don't. And I would suggest the reason that people don't like learning about history is because of the way we teach it. We don't teach it as this interconnected thing, as this cyclical thing, as this thing that's about themes that reappear throughout history. We teach it in a very disconnected and again, white Western way, which is very linear, right? Time is linear in the white Western imagination. So you have, you know, in history classes, the way we teach them most of the time in, in the white Western model is you just memorize a bunch of dates and you memorize a bunch of names and you memorize battles of wars and you memorize founding fathers and all the presidents and maybe parts of the constitution. And then you regurgitate that on a test and then you move on and, and there's not really a connectivity. Well, if you teach history that way, kids are not gonna like that. No one's gonna really enjoy that because those facts don't seem related to anything that's happening right now. And that comes from this white Western notion of time as linear, right? Where it's just, here's the beginning and here's where we are now and we're always making progress and things are always getting better, right? That's how we teach history around this issue of racism, right? It's like, well, you know, a long time ago, there was this problem and it was called slavery, or there was this problem called indigenous removal. But you know, some good people got together and then we stopped all that, or, or we got better, or we fixed that problem. And then there was another problem called segregation, but then some good people got together and then we fixed that. It's always this, this linear notion, right? That we're always moving forward rather than seeing what history really is, which is a lot of stops and starts, right? Sometimes it's two steps forward and then it's three steps back. Sometimes it's one step forward and six steps back. Sometimes it might be 20 steps forward, but then you lose five, right? So history doesn't just constantly progress. And if you teach that it does, then people don't get engaged in this work because they figure, well, you know, either somebody else will do it, or even if they don't, the time on the clock keeps moving. The, the calendar pages keep turning and eventually it'll all be better. You'll hear this constantly. I've been doing this work for 30 years and I always hear people say, well, you know, this generation's better. You know, when the, when the old folks die off, everything will be fine because the kids have got it all under control. Well, I was once in that generation of the kids who were going to have it all fixed. And here I am 52 and we didn't fix it. And then the people that are in their 30s are in that generation. It was like, oh, we're the millennials. We got this, like late 20s, early 30s. And they don't have it. And then we got the Gen Z folks who are like, no, no, we got it, right? And they don't either necessarily. So we can't assume uh, history operates the way that we've taught it in this linear process. But that's what we do in this society, right? There's, there's that old saying, what goes around comes around. The white Western model of history doesn't believe that. The white Western model of history is what goes around is gone, man. We don't have to look backward. We don't have to learn anything from the past. So we don't have historical memory. History are just these things that we put into containers and then we learn about them and we regurgitate them on a test and we don't make use of them, right? That's why I think it's so interesting and the materials that I was provided before today, I got the information about the, the project, uh, Project 108, 
there in Sitka and looking at these 108 year cycles between 1804 and 1912, and then between 1912 and now, and looking at the history of indigenous resistance in Sitka over that period of those 208 year frames, that's a very important model. And one that I think is, is important to, to replicate outside of Sitka, because what that speaks to is what I'm speaking of now, which is having historical memory, understand the connectivity between one's past and one's present, because the past affects the present. We don't learn that when it comes to history. We learn that in regard to science. So like if I take a book and I slide it across a table, we know what inertia is. We learn that in science class, right? The first law of motion, Newton's first law of motion says that an object in motion tends to remain in motion, right? Unless it's met by another force of equal or greater power or resistance, right? So if I slide a book across a table, it'll keep going until one of two things happen. It either falls off the table and hits the floor, right? Um, at which case it has been met by another force or when the friction from the table, right? Um, stops it, slows it down and stops it. But it's inertia just keeps it going. We know that's true about physical objects and the physical universe. What we neglect to understand is that inertia is also a property of the socioeconomic universe, the cultural universe, the political universe, right? What happens in one generation affects the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. That's true for us as people. And it's true for us as societies. And it's important to see oneself as embedded in that long march of history and to see that long march of history embedded in oneself because only that kind of humility will allow you to show up in this moment to actually change the direction of the society you're in is if you see yourself implicated in it and you see it implicated in you. Otherwise, you can see yourself as an abstraction and just be like, well, I don't have to really engage in that. And I think about this very personally because I realize the way that this history is embedded in me. Um, one of the things that I discovered when I was doing research for my memoir many years ago, and I was looking at family history, right? Um, just to give you a sense of what I mean when I say this history is embedded in me and it's important to, to own that. Um, so my 13th great grandfather, which is sort of a meaningless thing to say, because when you get that far back, you have millions of ancestors and millions of other people share the same 13th great grandfather, right? But one of my 13th great grandfathers is uh, Christopher Newport. And for those of you who know um, your history, you will know that Christopher Newport was, or you may know that Christopher Newport was the ship captain or really he was a pirate, to be honest. Um, but he was a ship captain who sailed the first boat into Jamestown in what became the Jamestown Colony in Virginia uh, in 1607. And that was the first uh, uh, long-term colonization project in what would become the United States. There had been previous colonization attempts by the Spanish, but that was really one of the first long-term English settlement attempts. And when Newport left and went back to England, and headed back to the States to bring, or not the States, what would become the States, but came back to the colony with supplies, he shipwrecked on what is now Bermuda and was there for about 10 months, having to rebuild the boat. He didn't die. Some of the people on the boat did. They rebuilt the boat and they sailed on to Jamestown about 10 or 11 months late. Well, if you know your history, you know that um, the colony, the, the white colonists, not yet called white, but the English colonists um, were dying out in Jamestown because they spent all their time looking for gold, which they were told would be there, uh, as opposed to planting crops and the indigenous people that they were really dependent on to keep them alive were growing pretty wary of their presence. Um, and the colony was dying. And if Christopher Newport's boat doesn't show up when it does, if it, if it shows up even three or four weeks later, it is entirely possible that the entire colony would have died out. Why am I telling you that story? Well, it's important because it means that my 13th great grandfather, by virtue of his existence and making it back to the Virginia colony, kept the colonial project in, in motion. Had that colony died out, it is entirely possible that the English attempts at colonization would have faltered because if they had to go back to the drawing board and start over again, the, the indigenous confederacy of, of nations in that region, led by the Powhatan, but others as well, were already in the process of trying to coalesce to resist incursion by the English. And had they had another year to coalesce that Confederacy, it's very possible they would have resisted that insurgent. So in a very real sense, the history 
of colonization and indigenous removal resides in my family line. I don't have guilt or shame over that because I know I'm not to blame for it, but it's part of who I am and by extension, part of who so many of us in this country are. Our history is connected to that. Past connects to the present. And I should also point out that on that boat with Christopher Newport was a man named John Rolfe. Who was John Rolfe? He was the man that introduced commercial tobacco into the Americas, which of course then created the first market for African enslavement in the Americas. So in that regard, if that ship you know, doesn't get back in the water and make it to Virginia, the whole history of the world is different. Now, as a direct descendant of Christopher Newport, I can't say that I'm sorry that he lived. Obviously, I would not exist had he not lived. But I just want to understand and I want us to reflect on how the history, good and bad, right, resides in all of us. And if we're not prepared to explore what that means and then what that asks us to do vis-a-vis -vis that history, then we're not going to be able to enter into this work with any sense of honesty or with any sense of, of, of decency. Um, so there is uh, an important part to historical memory. The second piece, and it's related to that, is we have to have a willingness to examine our history critically. So it's one thing to reflect on it, and it's one thing to acknowledge that the past affects the present, but it's another to actually do it critically, right? It's very easy to examine history uncritically. We do that all the time and we compartmentalize it, but we have to be willing to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. We, we celebrate the good, we love that. We don't mind the past as long as it reflects well on us but we want to ignore the pain. We do that in our own families, right? We, we like to talk about all the good that we do and the love that we have dispensed upon others and not the pain that we've caused to our own children or the pain that our parents caused to us. We all come from dysfunctional families. It's just some of us are more honest about that than others. You know, I've been in therapy off and on for a couple of years and I've learned to like deal with the pain and the trauma that I've experienced throughout the course of my life. Well, as a country, magnify the need for that for that therapy, if you will, or that therapeutic counseling by 350 million people. And some of that trauma is intensely personal. Some of that trauma is directly linked to identity and race and culture and nationality and sexuality and religion and all of these identity areas. And most of that doesn't get explored. And so we don't want to look at this critically. That's why the president can have a slogan like, make America great again, because to so many people, America is this thing that was great because they're not looking at that past critically. They don't see it the way that indigenous people, the way that black peoples, the way that brown peoples, the way that women as women, LGBTQ folks, the way that poor people for whom it's never been great, regardless of color, right? The way that non-Christians experience it, they can't see that that way and they have no interest in seeing that that way. But we have to be prepared to do that. Um, because if we don't, then we end up papering over our need to connect to that history and to rectify it. You won't try to rectify a history that you don't engage in a critical way. If you don't interrogate it, you won't see that there's anything in need of being repaired. And then the third thing related to that is a willingness to examine your own position in the world critically, which is something that we also rarely ever do. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about our own positions in the world, I just told you that the story, obviously, of, of my connection to Christopher Newport, but even, even on a more direct level than that, how often are we where we are because of a series of events over which we don't have a lot of control? And that could be in part because of inherited advantage, economic advantage. It could be the, you know, the result of inheriting certain racial privilege, gender privilege, class privilege, whatever. It could be connected to that, or it could just be luck. And the people that we met, you know, the mentor that we had, the teacher that we had in third grade who believed in us when we didn't believe in ourselves, maybe the, the coach or the choreographer, my kids are dancers. So I think about, you know, their, their mentors as choreographers that they had when they were young that inspired them to continue doing the art that they do and that my oldest daughter is now doing in college and both of my children looking to do professionally. If they don't have those mentors, those people who come into their lives, they're going to be on a very different track. Now, it might be a perfectly acceptable track. It might be a wonderful track. It might be fine, but it wouldn't be the track they're on. And so the people that we are, uh, it, that is also the result of the experiences that we have. And we don't generally think about that. 
And the reason that we don't generally think about that is because to acknowledge that we are the product of all these forces that we don't control is to challenge one of the most fundamental ideologies of this country. And this is the key ideology that makes it almost impossible to undo racism. So this is why I'm trying to bring this back sort of full circle to how we undo racism is um, that this underlying ideology of ours is one that says that wherever you end up as an individual and therefore wherever entire communities end up is the result of what? Their own effort, their own ability, their own willpower, their own determination, right? We have that as like the cornerstone belief of American society, more so than any other, even other Western industrialized nations, even more so than others that are Western and industrial models, we in the United States have really developed that as a cornerstone of our, of our secular gospel. And if, it, if you think of it in religious terms, like if, if America was a Bible, right, that would be Genesis 1-1 would be the idea that we all are rugged individuals and if we just work hard, we can make it. And, if you, and by extension, that means that if you didn't make it or if you're struggling or if you're suffering, right, then there's something wrong with you. So if you're poor or if you're struggling economically, it's something's wrong with you. If you're ill and, and, are, and are sick and have a pre-existing condition, why do you think there are people that don't want to cover pre-existing health conditions with, comprehensive health care. Well, they'll tell you, uh, they'll tell you in their, in their moments when they let their guard down that they think that the reason you're sick is you just don't take good enough care of yourself. You just don't eat right. You, you drink, you smoke, you don't exercise, you don't eat the right foods. Ultimately, they're saying it's your fault. Many years ago when the um, health care reform bill was being considered during the Obama administration, Rush Limbaugh famously said on the, on the radio that if we're going to cover people with pre-existing conditions, we should just call that welfare, right? In other words, he was using this stigma word. He was using this negative connotation that people have. Well, it's just welfare. That's a handout because ultimately he was saying, if you're sick, there's something wrong with you. Uh, you can see that in the COVID-19 debate, right? The idea that, well, yeah, it's going to kill some people, but you know, it's mostly people that are already sick and old, so I mean, what are you gonna do, right? Which is this very cavalier attitude that says some lives are not as valuable, and in particular, people who are already unhealthy, well, you know, they're sort of, the Nazis called them useless eaters, right? And in a way, that's what we're saying as well, because our mentality is, if you're down, you're down for a reason, right? If you're up, you're up for a reason, so if you're healthy, right? And if you're successful and if you're rich, well, it's probably because you're just the best. And if you're not wealthy, especially if you're poor, if you're not healthy, especially if you're sick, and if you're struggling, um, then it must be something wrong with you. That is what keeps racism more than anything in place. Because if you're taught that, and you're never taught to examine that critically, you're never taught to reflect on that and interrogate that, then what happens is you will look around and you'll see all of this inequality, right? And you'll see white folks disproportionately at the top of that, of that hierarchy. And you'll see black and brown folks, black, indigenous, and other folks of color down at the bottom of that hierarchy. You'll see men disproportionately at the top and women disproportionately below them. You'll see rich here and poor and working class here. And you'll just come to the conclusion just like a default position on a computer program, right? The default position is to rationalize that inequality because after all, you were told wherever you end up is all about you. So if you're, if you're told that, and we all are to some extent, you will either internalize superiority if you've been successful, or you will internalize oppression if you have not been quote unquote successful or if you're struggling, right? So those who have, who have done pretty well right, have this almost psychological incentive, right, to, to say, well, I, I made it because I worked really hard. And then I can lord that over you if you didn't make it and say that I'm better than you. So white supremacy starts to make sense to that person if they're white, right, and they see other white people sort of doing well, and they've done pretty well, it may, starts to make sense. Male supremacy and patriarchy starts to make sense. Um, class supremacy, under capitalism and economic inequality, it starts to make a lot of sense if you aren't critically examining it. And then the really sad part is let's say that you're not doing really well. Let's say that you are struggling. 
Let's say that you're having trouble in school or you're having problems with your health or you, you know, are having a hard time um, making ends meet financially and paying the bills, right? The society is telling you in a million different ways that there's something wrong with you. And if the society is telling you that, it takes an awful lot of strength to resist that conditioning, right? So the people that are hurting will often internalize that as self-hatred right, will internalize that as the belief that they have something broken in them. And very few of the counselors in our schools and very few of the therapists who have psychology degrees and very few of the doctors or social workers whose job it is to help bind up the wounds of such, of such damaged folks have the training to actually address that damage, right? How many of our doctors, how many of our therapists, how many of our counselors, how many of our social workers have really been trained in racialized trauma, have really been trained in the trauma of being told, on the one hand, you are the captain of your ship and wherever you end up is your own fault, and then failing, right? That's a traumatic experience. If I'm told that I can do anything I want if I just work hard and then I'm struggling, my only possible solution to that is to blame myself and to think that there must be something wrong with me. And out of that, what will I do? What, once I internalize that belief, what will I do? Well, I will destroy myself. I will lash out at others, often within my own community, or I will lash out at myself. And I might turn to drug or alcohol abuse. I might commit suicide or have suicidal ideation. I may take that out on my own family. I might take that out on the brothers and sisters in my own community, right? And so you'll see, you know, this sort of what, what, what the dominant culture calls dysfunction and pathology in poor communities, right? Or in black and brown communities, but never wanting to look at the root of that pathology and dysfunction, right? Which is the fact that we're saying, this is where we are as a society, this is what we're about, and then we're not delivering it. And then people internalize the blame and the shame around that and they take that out on themselves because everything in the society tells them it's their fault, right? So if we don't interrogate that notion of rugged individuality, and, and meritocracy in the society as a whole and in ourselves, it's going to be very difficult to undo racism and sexism and class inequality because we'll just keep justifying it. We'll just keep saying, well, I guess, you know, I guess those people, you know, they, just, they do deserve to have billions of dollars. And these people down here deserve to be on the street because if they were better people, they wouldn't be there. And so we end up shaming people. And of course, the danger of this and the irony of this that we need to explore, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this when we come back from the break, um, is that when you have that mentality of blaming and shaming yourself for your own shortcomings, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's bad enough that the winners, so to speak, in the society look down on the losers, so to speak, in the society. But the, the really ironic thing is you never know when you're not going to win, right? You may be a winner today. You may be doing really well today, but you know, life intervenes and sometimes things happen that you can't expect. So your, your company lays you off because of an economic downturn or you get sick because we all get sick. If we live long enough, we're probably all going to have something go wrong with us and, and uh, in terms of our health, for sure. Um, you know, you have a relationship that falls apart. Um, things happen. And if you've been led to believe your whole life that wherever you end up is all about you and it's gone pretty well for you, you know, 95% of the time, you might actually let your guard down to the fact that something could be sneaking up on you that you're not ready for. And so maybe when that happens, now you're not going to be prepared and you're going to start blaming yourself. So there's actually a reason that even the winners, right, so to speak, ought to be thinking critically about this mentality because that mentality can be a bit of a setup, right? It can actually set you up to have certain expectations. And maybe those expectations get fulfilled like 90% of the time, but it's that 10% when you're not ready for it, right, and you're not prepared uh, that can really, you know, knock you on your ass, so to speak. And so we have to be willing to interrogate our personal trajectory and be honest. Like for me, I have to be honest about saying that the reason I'm here today with you is not because I'm the smartest person that could have been on this call or because I'm the best spoken person who could have been on this call. I'm pretty good at what I do, but there are lots of people who are just as good or better. I'm here in part because 
as a white man doing this work, I have been given opportunities that many others have not. And I'm fully aware of that. My voice carries with or without a microphone, because as a white man, I fit the sort of visual of the society in terms of what an authority and what an expert is supposed to be, right? I'm also here because of luck. And we don't like to acknowledge luck because if we acknowledge luck, we're always afraid, oh, our luck could turn bad tomorrow. So we just want to assume it's all destiny. But I have a hard time believing that everything's purely destiny because that would mean that there are billions of people on this planet who are starving to death right now. And somehow that's their destiny. I have a very hard time getting my head around that concept. There's a lot of things that we have no control over in this world. And one of those things is, is, is how I got here into this space. I, uh, I graduated from college in 1990. And the very first job that I had out of college was working at a very high sort of high profile level in anti-racism work fighting a former Klan leader and neo-Nazi named David Duke, who was running for the U.S. Senate in Louisiana at that time and then governor in 1991. And the only reason I got that job was I knew the two guys who started that organization whose job it was to defeat him. The only reason I knew those guys was that one of them was a history professor and the other one was a graduate student and a friend of mine in the activist community and they offered me the job. The only reason I knew them was because I was at Tulane University in New Orleans. If I'd gone to any other school, I wouldn't have met them. They couldn't have given me that job. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to work against David Duke, which brought me to national attention. So I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today in all likelihood. The only reason I was at Tulane in New Orleans was because I was chasing a girl who was going to Louisiana State in Baton Rouge. True story. Right? I had been dating her in high school. She was from Lafayette, Louisiana, and she was on the debate team there. I was from Nashville, and we met each other on the national debate circuit. And in the manner of a 16-year-old, I fell in love with her, and she said, you, you have to go to Tulane, Tim. I wasn't going to go to Tulane. I was going to go to Emory in Atlanta. And she said, no, 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 no. We'll never see each other if you go to Atlanta. You have to go to New Orleans. You'll only be an hour and 20 minutes away. And I said, oh, okay, let me just change my whole life plan for this young woman. And I did. And I ended up going to Tulane. If I don't meet her during a summer debate camp in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1985, then I'm not going to be going to Tulane. I'm not going to meet those men. I'm not going to get that job. I'm not going to have that exposure to national anti-racism work. And I'm not going to be doing what I'm doing today. But the only reason I met her was because I was a debater in high school. And the only reason I was a debater was because even though I had always been a really good baseball player, I was my thing. I was a jock. I was a baseball player. I was really good. But I had a horrible tryout when I tried out for my high school team. It was like all of a sudden I'd forgotten how to play and I got cut from the baseball team. And I had to find a different activity. If I make that team, which I should have, the guys that made the team I had played against and I was as good or better than most of them, but I got cut. They didn't. If I make that team, I'm not going to be a debater, which means I'm not going to meet Monica, which means I'm not going to go to Tulane, which means I'm not going to meet those men. I'm not going to get the, that job. And you see how all of that past affects the present. Me acknowledging that, having radical humility about the success that I've had and acknowledging that, that has, I have very little control over that. That has nothing to do with my hard work. It has nothing to do with merit. It has nothing to do with some you know, super ability. It has to do with the fact that I have some skill sets and I had the opportunity to utilize those skill sets, right? It was the combination of talent and opportunity. And that's what it is for everyone. But if we tell a different story, if we tell a story that says you get out what you put in, then we'll never be able to undo racism, privilege, and inequality because we'll constantly be rationalizing it. We'll constantly be justifying it. We have to be prepared to be radically honest about our past individually, the nation's past collectively, and then the connection between our past and the nation's past. And if we do that, if we can develop historical memory, realizing that history is cyclical, not linear, what goes around does in fact come around and we are accountable to that. Secondly, that we have to be prepared to examine that history critically. And then third, that we have to be prepared to examine our own past critically and the way that that connects to the collective. Then I think we stand a fighting chance at having the framework that will allow us to undo racism. But if you don't ask those questions because you're too afraid to, or because you, you know, Donald Trump this week said they're gonna 
cut off funding for schools that teach the 1619 project from the New York Times, which, you know, really all it says, it's really inarguable among legitimate historians, is that white supremacy and enslavement were central to the founding of the American Republic. I'm not sure how anyone could deny that and consider themselves to be historically well read, but there are people who don't want that story. They don't want, they want to talk about America as this sort of, you know, helpless giant that had the best of intentions, but didn't always live up to our intentions. When the truth is we were founded on the premise of inequality. It wasn't accidental. It wasn't incidental. It was deliberate. And so when you're founded on the basis of inequality, you can't be surprised when at the end of that process, you're still producing inequality. That would be like standing at the end of a conveyor belt in a sausage factory and expressing outrage that it continuously gives you sausage. If you're at the end of a conveyor belt in a sausage factory and you're wondering where the chicken nuggets are, it is obvious that you did not read the sign and you need to go back outside and look at the sign on the building because it says sausage factory, you probably should expect sausage. And in this society, the inequality was baked in from the beginning. If we're not prepared to face that and confront that and understand the conveyor belt that that has put us on, both individually and collectively, we have no hope. If we are prepared to do that, then we can have a fighting chance at undoing these systems of oppression and inequality. But it's going to take commitment. It's going to take a lot of willingness to look into the mirror, both our own and the mirror of the nation, in an unflinching uh, way in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that's not sentimental, but in a way that's honest. And when we come back from the break, which I'm going to send you out to here uh, right now, when we come back, we'll talk about what that looks like specifically and some ways that we might be able to actually do that. Uh, and then, of course, I'll take some questions when I'm done with that. But this is sort of the, the framework I want to offer, the analytical framework, the kinds of things we need to be doing. And with that in mind, send you to your break, recognizing that right there in Sitka, you're already doing that kind of, of excavation, right, with, with uh, the Project 108 concept and this notion of looking at the continuity of history. You're far ahead of most of us in that regard. I think that's an important model to continue to develop and to continue to explore as you move forward. And I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with you. We'll take a five minute break or so, we'll come back and we'll pick up and, and we'll talk about some of the specifics of things that, that we can do. But thank you so, so much. Welcome back everybody to the group level. Tim, uh, taking some excellent notes. I hope everybody else is too. I put in the chat, if you have a question for Tim, um, just type it instead of typing it to everyone, type it to ask a question and then that'll go to Leah and she'll get those to us for the, for the final Q&A at the end. So um, Tim, thanks so much. Back to you and uh, excited for part two. Thank you. So in this part, what I, and I want to leave plenty of time for, for questions and for discussion after. And so this, this part may not, the formal part of, of this section may not take up the full 40 or so minutes that I was planning. That'll leave more time for, for Q&A though. Uh, so the first piece that I want to, you know, again, reiterate is that in the undoing of racism, privilege, and, and inequality, if we're going to critically evaluate our history, we have to do that critical autobiography piece. And that means really sitting down. I mean, I can remember, um, uh, you know, having people many years ago when I was uh, a grassroots activist in New Orleans, just out of college, and I was working with some folks at the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And one of the things that they um, asked me early on was sort of why, why I was doing this work. Why did I care about these things? Um, you know, sort of trying to get clear on what my motivation, because they said, you know, as a white man, you don't necessarily have to care about this. You don't necessarily have to think about this if you don't want to, um, because you probably can ignore it and avoid it and not really pay any price for your obliviousness. So what is it, you know, that makes you want to think about these things and do things uh, to cr help produce racial justice? And my answer initially, which was not very well thought out, but it sounded appropriate, I guess, in the moment for my 24-year-old self or whatever I was, was something, you know, along the lines of, well, you know, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, which they said, yeah, that, that one's already taken. That's Dr. King's line. So you, you can't just steal that. You need to come up with your own thing. They said, why don't you sit down and, 
and take inventory, right? Really take stock of your life and what brought you to this moment because there have to be things, right? Um, I mean, the truth is none of us who care about this subject and none of you who are on this call um, have probably come to your concern about racism and colonialism and injustice just because of a book you read or because of a class that you took. I mean, maybe you did take a really great class, you had a really great teacher, or somebody said, hey, you should read this, and you did, and it got you really like excited about the subject, but, but that alone probably wouldn't have done it, right? And for me, that was certainly true. It wasn't any class I had taken, it wasn't any article that I had read. Uh, in the modern era, it wouldn't be just a YouTube video someone would have seen, right? There has to be something about your personal experience that has allowed you to see some things that maybe otherwise you wouldn't have seen and that other people don't see. And it's important to know what that is, right? Number one, because it helps you get clear on why you're, why you're concerned about the issues that you're concerned about. It also keeps you from being judgmental towards other people who aren't quite where you are yet, which is also a really important thing if we're gonna build movements for social change, is you can't, you can't be arrogant about the fact that you get it right, or that you understand some things and maybe somebody else doesn't because you might have only learned the stuff that you know, you know, figuratively speaking, like a week ago, right? And I always tell people you can't really be arrogant about, you know, you, you can't yell at someone else on Thursday for not knowing stuff that you only learned on Monday, right? Figuratively speaking, metaphorically speaking, because so oftentimes that's what happens. We, we start to scold other people because we haven't actually looked at our own history. So in my case, if the reason that I care so deeply about these issues is embedded in my history and my story, I can't take any credit for that story. It's the family I was born into. It's the experiences that I had. Lakota sort of alluded to some of that in the setup, in the intro, right? I grew up in Nashville. Uh, I went to a preschool at a historically black college. So all of my early peers were black kids. Uh, the women who ran that program were mostly African-American women. So I learned to respect black authority because my mom made the decision when I was four to subordinate me to black authority. But I can't take any credit for the fact that having had that experience, I then learned to respect black authority. That was it because I had that experience. If I hadn't had that experience, I might not have come to, to be in a place where I could hear black women, let's say in particular, talking about these issues. But because of that experience, I was open to it. I can't take any credit for that. I can't be arrogant or haughty about that experience. Uh, I went to college in New Orleans where I was exposed to the mentors that I had at the People's Institute. If I don't have them, you know, I'm not gonna be in this position. So I have to always do that critical autobiography to realize not just you know, success being connected to luck and privilege and things that happen to you, but even just your awareness right, is also about that. The people that came into your life, and if someone in your own family or a friend or a colleague didn't have that experience, they may not see what you see, but, but shaming them is not gonna help them see that. You have to actually talk about your own experience. What I have found over the years, you know, I used to, I used to go and I would be asked to go and, and debate right-wing people about these issues and go, you know, I would debate these ultra-conservative people who basically denied that racism was a problem or, you know, wanted to blame black and brown folks for any problem they experienced. And, and I did that for years until I finally came to realize just the utter uselessness of it. Because what it was, was really just me coming and t saying what I believe and that person saying what they believe and they bring their people, I bring my people and nobody really learns anything. What I think is much more interesting is to have a conversation about why we think what we think, because more than what we think, if we're talking about what we believe is true, we're having an argument, we're having a debate. If we talk about why we believe it to be true, we're talking about our experiences and we can actually learn from one another that way. There's a humility in that. So if we're gonna undo racism, undo systems of inequality, we have to be critically analyzing ourselves and have the radical humility to, to get clear for ourselves. And so when the People's Institute asked me that question, why do you care about it? And I sat down and I, this is 1993 you know, or whatever. And I, I get out a you know, pen and paper, you know, a pad and paper, because I didn't have a computer and so I had no technology. I'm just writing it old school. And I come up with five or six or 10 pages of information about my history that was about race, where race was implicated in my history. 
whether it was privilege that I'd received unearned as a white person or whether it was about racism I'd seen expressed toward my black friends or teammates on ball teams I played for or the experiences that I'd witnessed in school, right? And there were 10 pages maybe of, of, of things. And I started to realize how central that had been to my life. And once I realized that, once I did that critical autobiography, I realized that I had to do this work because it was so deeply embedded in who I was and who I had become that I had to be responsive to that, right? And if we're going to build a movement to undo racism, we need people that are invested in that work at a personal level, not just at the academic level, not just because they read a really great book that somebody recommended, not just because they took a class in critical race theory or black history or indigenous people's history or Latinx history. Like it's critical to have that personal reflection piece in there. So that's a really important number one in terms of the, what do we need to be thinking of and doing next um, related to that on a more communal level is we have to learn to take examples from other countries and apply them to our own. Uh, we don't like to do that in the United States because we have that sort of, um, that notion of American exceptionalism, which says that we know how to do everything better than anyone else. And so we don't wanna learn from other people. But there are other societies where injustices, even really truly horrific injustices, have been examined far more honestly than our own. Uh, South Africa, post-apartheid, you know, had a truth and reconciliation process. I'm not a big fan of the word reconciliation because I feel like it's very hard to reconcile something which hasn't been consiled in the first place, right? But whether you like the term or not, the concept was that in the post-apartheid era, we were going to expect everyone in South Africa to come to the fore and to, and to talk about what they did and who they did it to and what that process was like for them. And they would have to be honest, radically honest, right? And accept responsibility and take accountability for their actions in that system. And that way there could be some type of conciliation or justice process that would emerge. But it was this experiment in radical historical memory and radical honesty and radical humility. And it wasn't perfect. And South Africa has not, you know, emerged from that process of fully formed multiracial democracy. They still have their, their problems. They're only, they're not even 30 years into democracy or the attempt at it in South Africa. So it's going to take a long time. But here we are 230 some odd years, 230, what, four, 44, 244 years into the experiment in what we call the US. And we've never even attempted it. We've never attempted truth and reconciliation. You know, when we do that land acknowledgement at the beginning, both for you all in Sitka and then when I did the one here for Nashville, like the acknowledgement is really important, but what, what must follow that acknowledgement, because the first step, right, that the next step is really figuring out what is then the obligation morally and ethically to those people who were naming, what actually has happened to them, what has been their experience. It isn't enough to acknowledge it unless we're prepared to take some role in repairing the damage, but it's very hard to repair damage if we're not clear on what that damage is. And in this country, since we don't have historical memory, we're not clear on it. So having some form of truth and reconciliation, or maybe I prefer, you know, truth and justice, whatever, whatever you want to call it, commissions locally, not just, not just one for the whole nation, because 350 million people in 50 states and other territories and all the cities and, and counties. And, you know, obviously the experience is different. The experience that we need to be accountable for here in Nashville is different than the experience in Sitka. It's different than the experience in Rhode Island. There are relationships, there are connections that we want to see, but each community should really be having its own truth and justice and or reconciliation process where we try to bring this history out so that people can get clear on it. Not, not to shame people, not to make people feel bad, right? But to make people have a sense of how we got to this place. Because if you grow up not understanding how we got to where things are, you'll never question that. And if you're not questioning it, you won't seek to fix it. And like I said, we don't, we don't like to learn from others. We like to, we like to lecture others about their, their horrors. We like to lecture others about their genocides. We like to lecture others about their human rights abuses. And rarely do we turn that mirror back on ourselves. I remember many years ago, um, I remember opening up the local paper here in Nashville and there was a story. This was back in the year 2000. So this would have been before the 2000 election. So Bill Clinton is still the president. Um, and I think Louis Free is the head of the FBI. And Director Free, FBI Director Free, 
had had I guess implemented some type of anti-racism training program or something, and 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 it was looking at um, sort of the history of intolerance, right? But it was mostly looking at intolerance in Germany and the way that the Holocaust had happened, right? And the way that people had remained silent in the face of the German. Uh, genocide of of European Jews and Romani and LGBTQ folks and Slavs and others, right? Um, and then in Tennessee, according to this article, there was a program sort of similar to what the FBI director was doing uh, with that agency. Here in Tennessee, there was a program created by the Tennessee Department of Workforce uh, Education and Workforce Department, or so I can't remember the name, but but it was it's basically the department that handles um, the GED program, so the high school equivalency uh, program. And they had developed a curriculum that was supposed to be about, again, tolerance and fighting prejudice and all of that. Um, but what was interesting about the article, very similar to the program that the FBI director was creating, it was looking at intolerance mostly elsewhere. And so the program focused mostly on Nazism in Germany and what Hitler had done at that point, you know, 60 some odd uh, years earlier, and now we're, you know, uh, uh, 80 some odd years after the fact. And I understand the value of the lesson. I mean, I happen to be Jewish, so I understand that there are a lot of lessons that we need to learn about the Holocaust and what that was. Um, but I also know there's something really ironic about a school system, or in this case, a GED system developing their curriculum in Tennessee, focused on someone else's crimes, focused on someone else's horrific treatment of people, focused on someone else's intolerance, rather than looking at your own. I mean, that particular government agency here in Nashville, which is the state capital in Tennessee, so you know all the government offices are right here. Um, that particular workforce development office is about a 15 minute drive, maybe 20 minutes uh, in traffic from the house of Andrew Jackson, right? one of this nation's premier killers of indigenous people and removers of indigenous people from their lands. Right, someone who instructed his troops to mutilate the bodies of indigenous people that his troops killed uh, at Horseshoe Bend. Um, and so why is it that we have to go 80 years in the past, right, and half a globe away to talk about intolerance and injustice when you could literally just take a field trip out to Andrew Jackson's house and sit under the lovely trees on his, uh, on his land and think about what he himself was the architect of. Well, the answer, of course, is obvious, right? We don't wanna talk about our own crimes. We don't wanna do truth and even reconciliation, let alone truth and justice. But if we don't, we're gonna have a very hard time getting where we need to go. It's not gonna be enough in and of itself, but it's, it's an important piece uh, of the puzzle. It's been an important piece of the puzzle in South Africa. It's been an important piece of the puzzle in Rwanda. Uh, after the genocide there in the in the 1990s, uh, it's been a process that has been used as well in Northern Ireland, and and in every instance where it's used, it at least has some benefit to the local community because it brings out the important information that has been really kept from people. Our ignorance of our history. Um, this is another thing we want to be honest about. This is a, a ignorance which has historically been embedded by the structures themselves. It's not our fault that we don't know these things. It's not really our fault for, for not knowing the accurate history of the past and its connection to the present. You can't know what you weren't taught and you can't teach what you weren't taught. And so we have many generations of educators who themselves weren't taught these things and have no idea how to transmit that knowledge. So we have to really recreate a lot of these systems and doing that through a truth and reconciliation or truth and justice process uh, is a really important piece of that puzzle. It's sort of, you know, tantamount to having um, therapy for an entire community. I talked about therapy in the first part of the session. And, and, and the point I was trying to make is, you know, when I started therapy, you know, the point was to try to excavate the damage of my own upbringing and the trauma that I had been exposed to that was leading me to sometimes reenact and act out in ways vis-a-vis -vis my own family and friends and just behaving in ways that are unproductive and hurtful, right? Where does that come from? Uh, and we rarely wanna ask that question, even as individuals. When I started doing that as an individual and you start to get sort of in touch with where your behaviors are coming from, you can start to then see them, 
critically assess them. You can catch yourself when you're going down that road again. But if you don't explore them and you don't have someone to help you explore them, right, then you'll remain in that ignorance. And when you start to see that, all these things start to make sense to you and you start to realize, oh, okay, I can forgive myself for this behavior, but only when I know where it comes from so that I can interrupt it. The same is true for the society, right? We can be forgiven for our involvement in injustice, but only insofar as we're aware of it and are prepared to take action. It isn't about shaming us for, for being embedded in that. We, we had no choice but to be embedded in those structures. We were born into those structures, right? But we do have a choice in terms of how we are going to respond now once we, once we understand that we are there. You know, you're not, in therapy, one of the things I learned was I wasn't really to blame for my trauma, right? But I have to take responsibility for the trauma that I bring into the world and inflict on others. That's where, that's where it becomes mine. Right. And I can never take responsibility for the trauma I cause if I don't have an awareness of where that trauma comes from. And so we've got to have that process, not just for ourselves uh, as individuals, but also for our society as a whole. And the third piece, and it relates to all of this, and I sort of alluded to it before, but I want to get a little deeper into it before uh, we go into questions in a second. Um, one of the things that I, I think is so critical in this moment of uprising and people really beginning to ask these questions that you all are asking today and that I'm helping you explore about how to undo racism and inequality is that what concerns me is that when you have so many people sort of rushing into that movement, sort of, go, it's like a car that goes from zero to a hundred in like three seconds, right? There's a reason they don't make engines that do that. I mean, I guess some drag racing cars can do that, but they tend to blow their engines out and you can't do that and then drive around the block with that car because it's going to overheat and it's going to blow up the engine. Um, when you have an engine that burns that fast or you have a fire that rages really, really hot, really, really quickly, it tends to burn out um, very fast and it's hard to sustain. And I think part of where we need to be is thinking about what our motivations are for this work. The reason that so many people I think are so so adamant and wanting to get into this struggle all of a sudden, right? People who, who had been hitting sort of the snooze button on the alarm clock in previous years, even when there were black and brown folks screaming and yelling and, and trying to get attention, right? It's like the, the, the uh, my friend Victor Lewis uses the um, analogy of the Titanic and talks about how, you know, there are always people down in the, in the steerage section of the Titanic who knew the ship was going down first, right? And they were yelling to the people above them, hey, the ship's going down, you know, there's a hole in the boat and it's taking on water and it's going to sink. And the people in the middle were like, ah, eh, come on, what are you talking about, right? And the people on the top, they didn't care. They got violin music and pianos and they're all drinking and having a good time and they're dancing, you know, and they're having a great party. And then the people down below were like, no, no, for real. Like, really, this is, this is gonna, we're gonna die. We're all, it's gonna sink. And then the middle's like, no, nah, come on, it's not. And the people at the top are like, ah, come on, what are you talking about? And really, of course, the people at the bottom knew, right? They had, the, they had the first awareness that this thing was going to happen and they were trying to alert everyone else. And for the most part, people weren't listening. That's sort of how America's been, is a little bit like the Titanic, right? People at the bottom screaming and yelling like, hey, we got a problem. And a lot of other folks saying, well, not really. Maybe a problem for you, but it's not really a problem for me, right? And so I think when all of a sudden people realize there's a problem and they rush into involvement. They're like, how do I get involved? What do I do? The thing that worries me, right, is, is that motivation sustainable? Well, what is the motivation? Is it shame and guilt? I've heard a lot of that in the last several months. A lot of white folks in particular who seem to me coming from a place of, oh my God, how could I not have known? How could I, how could I not have realized what people are experiencing? How could I be so ignorant and then sort of beating themselves up about their privilege or beating themselves up about their ignorance around these issues? I, I see nothing productive about that shame or guilt. Shame and guilt has never liberated a single oppressed person from oppression. It's not a helpful thing. In fact, psychologically, the only thing that shame wants is to go away. Like that's shame's goal is to be relieved right? Guilt's goal is to dissipate. And so if you have shame or guilt, you're, you, you want to get away from it. The easiest way to get away from it is just hit that snooze button again and go back to bed, right? And then you don't have to think about it. So if people are moving into this work out of shame or guilt, we need to find a new hobby, 
and we certainly need to find a new motivation at the very least. Or if they're, if they're joining out of rage, right? Outrage is, a, is an understandable emotion in the face of injustice. You know, there's that saying that if you're not angry, you're not paying attention, absolutely. But at the same time, outrage is really hard to sustain too. Because the only way you sustain outrage is to have really awful stuff happening all the time that you can be outraged by, but you don't want awful stuff to happen all the time. Right? You want to be able to breathe and to think and to analyze and to strategize and to plan, but it's really hard if you're bouncing from one outrage to another outrage to another outrage. So if the motivation is moral righteousness and, oh my God, things are terrible, we got to go into the streets, that might sustain you for a week or a couple of weeks. I don't think it's going to sustain you in the long term because most of the work is not in the street. Most of the work is not at the demonstration. Most of the work is not going to make the news. Most of the work is not protesting, right? Most of the work is the stuff we do every day in our agencies where we work, in our companies where we work, in the schools that our kids attend, changing the curriculum, changing the hiring process, the recruiting process, the standards that we're using to evaluate excellence, rethinking systems and structures. That stuff is what's meaningful, but it's not real exciting. It, it's not, it does not going to make the news. I don't even know how you do a story about that, right? There's no, there's no great visuals to rethinking the, the policies and the practices of your workforce. Like that's not going to be the, you know, lead story on the evening news, but that's the stuff that really keeps us in it. So how do we then think about our motivation in a way that is sustainable and sustains the struggle for racial justice? Well, the good news is I think in this moment we do have a way to go and, and a direction in which we can go. And I alluded to it before when I talked about the whole way that um, rugged individualism and the notion of, you know, wherever you end up is all about your own effort can actually hurt even the winners, right? We know it's bad for the people who are suffering, but how it's even dangerous for the people who usually are winners because you can't win all the time. Maybe the top one tenth of 1% can. You know, the really, really super wealthy super powerful, they usually keep their stuff, right? They're usually gonna win. You can, they can pretty much count on it, right? But anybody that's not in that really super elite strata, you never know when life is gonna sneak up on you, right? And so there's a real interest that most of us have. Not all, again, if you're in that real top group, maybe not, but everybody else has an interest in rethinking this society and the way that the society operates. And it's something that Derek Bell, the late great legal scholar called interest convergence, right? This idea that he put forward in his life where he's one of the founders of critical legal theory. Um, he talked about how, you know, all the progress that's ever been made in this country's history, especially for black folks, but you could make this argument just more broadly for folks of color generally, has never been the result of you know, white America suddenly waking up and going, oh my God, can you believe what we've done to black and brown peoples? Like, this is awful that we did this. We, we took all this land and we killed these folks or we enslaved these folks or we segregated people. My God, that's never been the, the primary reason. I'm not saying there aren't some people who have said that, but that's never been the thing that's brought about change that so suddenly most white people were like appalled at the history of oppression. That's never been it. What has happened is according to Bell, that there have been these moments where the interest of black people, and again, we could say black and brown folks more broadly, have dovetailed with the interest of the larger, including white society. And when their interests have converged, that's when things have happened. And so, you know, you can think of, you know, the abolition of enslavement, that didn't happen because of some, you know, moral awakening on the part of slave owners and their supporters or the white folks who had sort of passively remained silent during the period of enslavement. That changed because it was no longer sustainable. The, the, the union was not going to be kept together on the basis of half free and half slave, as Lincoln said, so that we ended up having to have a war and abolition because it wasn't a sustainable system. That was the interest of black people and the interest of the larger country converging, which is why we had change. If you think about the civil rights movement, Bell talks about how you know desegregation of the schools, the, the end of, of, of formal segregation and the civil rights struggle itself. One of the reasons that was successful to the extent that it was, obviously it didn't complete the job, but the reason that they were able to win the victories that they did win 
desegregation of schools, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, et cetera, was because in that particular moment, think about what else was happening around the world, right? The, the, the colonial experiment, the European system of colonialism was starting to crumble. And you had all of these nations and peoples of color around the world who were coming out from under the boot of colonial oppression. And they were looking around to try to figure out what model are we gonna adopt? Are we gonna adopt this Western model, which was a more capitalistic model, or are we gonna go with the, with the Eastern Soviet model of socialism, right? Because at that time, we're in the middle of the Cold War. And it's really hard to persuade people around the world to go with your model if you're oppressing people who look like them in some way, right? So if I have my boot on the neck of people like you, you're not going to you're not going to think that I've got the model that you want. So we, there was a propaganda value, right? A, a sort of cynical PR value in doing certain reforms just to put on a pretty face. And Bell said, if that doesn't happen, we may not get desegregation of schools. We may not get the civil rights laws as soon as we did. But in that moment, the interest of black people and brown peoples happened to converge with the interest of the larger society to put on a face of democracy even if it wasn't entirely accurate, right? To actually say, oh, no, no, this is who we are. You think we're bad guys, but really this is who we are, right? And so that interest convergence led to certain reforms. Not enough, right? But what it demonstrates is that only when the interests have sort of dovetailed have we actually had progress. Well, what does that mean for us today? What it means is shame and guilt won't suffice, right? Outrage won't suffice. If white people are getting involved in the struggle against racism to save other people, because they're angry at injustice, how long is that gonna last? And is that sufficient anyway? That, that, that's sort of a charity impulse, isn't it? It's sort of like, oh, here, I'll help you with your problem. But if you don't see it as your problem too, if you don't see your interest as converging with black and brown interest, will you really stay in the work? Well, according to Bell, the answer would be no. According to history, the answer would be no. If you really want to begin to undo racism, you have to begin to ask the question, where are the interests of black and brown peoples converging with the interest of white peoples in this moment? Because if they're not converging, it's going to be very hard, right? I mean, for years, people have asked me the question, Tim, look, why, why would white people who have advantages and privileges relative to black and brown folks, why would they give that up? It's a good question, isn't it? Like, if I have certain advantages, why would I want to relinquish those? in a society that says, hey, if you have an edge, you should make use of that. You should, you should add to your advantage. You don't give it away. Like when my, when my parents were uh, kids in that generation of the, of the 40s and, and, and well, the 50s and 60s, parents used to tell their kids, apparently, uh, eat all your food. There are children starving in China or something like that. Notice what they didn't say, though, right? They didn't say, hey, look, there are children starving in China. Maybe you ought to eat less and box up some of that food and send it to them, right? They didn't say that, or they said, count your blessings, but they didn't tell you to count them so that you could give them away, right? They said, count them so you know how gosh darn lucky you are, and then make more of them, right? In other words, you weren't supposed to give away your edge. So when people say, why would a person with privilege want to change the system that gives them privilege? It's a really good question, but the answer is interest convergence, right? The answer is what Bell was talking about. What would be some examples of interest convergence in this moment? Well, I mentioned one already in the first section, right? This idea that, that the myth of meritocracy and individualism is really dangerous. It might work for you 90% of the time, but that 10% is really problematic, right? Because if things go badly, and all of a sudden you lose your job, your marriage falls apart, you get a bad grade in school and you never got one of those before and all of a sudden things are seeming to go bad in your life and you're struggling to pay your bills, right? The only thing this society tells you to do is double down and work harder because there must be something wrong with you. You must not have the right attitude. So you need to go and spend thousands of dollars to get a life coach or something, right? Uh, I gotta get a life coach because I don't know how to do this right. Let, you know, it's something wrong with me. That's the way that we, teach and talk in this society. So that's number one is that's not very healthy, right? It's not very healthy to, to, to constantly be like on a, on a hamster wheel, right? In a hamster cage where you're just constantly sort of on a treadmill trying to keep up with yourself and, and or, or living in a society where you're always trying to keep up with your neighbors and just make sure that, you know, you're not slipping behind them. That's a, it's exhausting. It's physically exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting. It's not healthy. 
as a way to live. So even the people who were sort of winning, right? The people that are sort of doing well, there's a cost for doing well, right? There's a cost for, for being on top in a system of inequality. Now that cost is nothing compared to what the people at the bottom are having to pay. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying it's the same and we ought to all feel bad for the winners, right? I'm not saying that. Like, I'm not saying feel, feel sorry for the, for the people at the top, but I'm saying at least acknowledge, like I said before, if the mouth of the river is white supremacy and inequality, everything that flows downhill from that is going to poison everyone. It's not going to poison us in the same way, but it's going to poison all of us. And in this particular moment, it's going to poison even those white folks who are sort of middle to upper middle class and think that it works for them. But God forbid it suddenly doesn't, right? God forbid the plant closes. God forbid your, your boss, you know, they close the, the company and they move overseas. You know, God forbid you, you can't afford your health care. You lose your insurance, right? Uh, or we have an economic recession and now you can't pay your house note or your rent, or we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are obviously financially stressed and not really sure if they're going to have enough money to keep their business open or they're going to be able to keep their job, right? What do you do with that? So in that moment, there's a real interest we have in rethinking that whole ideology of Americanism, that whole ideology that says wherever you end up is all about you, if you start to realize how dangerous that is, maybe you'll start to undo it. Maybe you'll realize that you, you know, would be better off to see the society the way black and brown folks do. Because the irony is people of color in this society have always understood that that whole ideology was a bit of a myth, right? I'm not saying that they don't internalize it some, like everybody's exposed to it. Everybody internalizes it a bit. And like I said, sometimes you turn it against yourself when you fail, right? Because you blame yourself and you internalize that oppression. But there's also part of every black and brown person growing up in this society that knows, wait a minute, it can't really be like that, right? Because there are black and brown folks that know they see people work hard every day and don't get anywhere, right? And they see a lot of other people who get real far and didn't work that hard for it, right? Who inherited hundreds of millions of dollars from their families or, you know, whatever. And so there's, for black and brown folks, they have a more critical eye about that myth than white folks do. White folks should have been listening to the black and brown folks who were saying that. Rich people or middle class people should have been listening to the working class folks in the bottom of the Titanic who were saying, hey, you know, this ship is eventually going to go down and we're all going to go down with that, right? Um, so that's one aspect of interest convergence. Um, the other aspect of it, if you think about what happens when your expectations are not fulfilled, uh, and you can start to see how dangerous you can become either to others or to yourself, then perhaps you can see another element of interest convergence. So here's what I mean by that. Um, years ago in the 60s, there was a theory, and it was a theory developed by sociologists mostly, that they were trying to figure out why it was that the riots, the rebellions, the uprisings happened um, in 1966 and 65 and 68 rather than 56 and 55 and 58. Because if you think about it, you could make the argument that, well, why are these things happening after some civil rights laws were passed, right? You have riots in 66 and 68. That's after there's been some progress. You got the Civil Rights Act, got the Voting Rights Act. Why are the riots and the rebellions happening after that rather than before? You'd think maybe when things were worse 10 years ago, that's when you would have had those uprisings. And the theory of rising expectations said, well, the reason that didn't happen was because people were just trying to survive 10 years earlier and 20 years earlier, but in 66 and 68, now you started promising people justice, right? Now the system actually said, oh, we're going to get better and we're going to do this right and we're going we're to have justice. And then folks had expectations now. 10 years earlier, they didn't expect anything. Now you start making promises you don't intend to keep. Folks realized, oh, wait, you didn't really mean it. Oh, oh, you meant a little bit of justice, but not really justice, right? And so now there was a frustration of those expectations, right? You had rising expectations, but the reality only hit like about halfway up, right? And so that's what created the anger and the rage. Well, if that's true, and there's a lot of evidence for that theory, not just in the US, but around the world, how much more true might it be if you've always had high expectations? If you've always expected your life to go really well and suddenly it doesn't? Or if you always were told, all you gotta do is work hard and it'll be fine, it'll pay off again. If you're a person of color, you sort of knew it wasn't that easy. If you were a woman of any color, you sort of knew it wasn't that easy. 
if you grew up poor, you sort of knew it wasn't that easy. But if you grew up middle class or above, especially if you were white, and especially if you're a guy, you actually had the privilege of believing that. So if you tell me that, if you tell me, hey, man, all you got to do is work hard, play by the rules, keep your nose clean, don't get in trouble, everything will be fine. And then all of a sudden, I still can't pay my bills. And I still can't afford health care. And I still can't send my kid to college and my marriage is falling apart and I lost my job at the plant or whatever, or my little town that I live in is dying and nobody wants, everybody's moving away and there's no jobs and there's no businesses and there's no economic activity. What do I do? You promised me everything, right? So that's even bigger than the person who never expected anything. And then they started expecting something because we had a, a little bit of progress. And then you frustrated that if that person who only expected stuff for like a few years, can get outraged by the lack of follow through. Imagine what happens to people who were promised from the day they were born that everything will be all right if you just work hard and then they find out that's not true. What do they do? They either lash out or they lash in. If they lash out, they'll attack everybody else and blame them for their shortcomings. So they can blame immigrants, they can blame black folks, they can blame high taxes, they can blame Muslims, they can blame whatever, right? They, they, they find a scapegoat for their problems. But of course, that never solves the problem. It's like the whole notion, ancient times of scapegoats, right? They would, the whole term comes from the idea that if there was a plague or there was a drought, you know, you would get a goat and you would sacrifice the goat on an altar to your God. And that was supposed to end the plague because the sins of the people would be transferred to the goat. But that didn't end the plague. That, that didn't make it rain just because you killed a goat, right? And so scapegoating never actually solves a problem. All it does is allow you to displace your anger, but in a way that doesn't really help you. So I have an interest in not doing that, but I live in a society that encourages me to do that because you tell me that the world is mine to conquer and I should always be on top. And then if I'm struggling, like some of these white folks in these small towns all around the United States that, you know, can't, can't are having a hard time surviving and they're having a hard time paying their bills and they're turning to right-wing politicians and the president and others to sort of tell them what their enemy is and who their enemy is, or they turn it inside, right? Why do we think we have an opioid crisis in our country? Why do you think we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and millions of families that have been affected disproportionately white working class folks affected by the opioid epidemic, by fentanyl and by, and by oxy and by heroin, right? What is, what, is, what is an opiate? An opiate is a drug that only has one purpose. And the purpose of an opiate is to block pain receptors, right? It doesn't actually fix your problem. Like if you have cancer, they'll give you opiates to stop the pain, but it doesn't get rid of the cancer. If you bust a disc in your back, lifting something that you shouldn't be, they might give you opiates to deal with the pain, but it doesn't fix the disc, right? You have to have surgery for that, right? And so in a sense, you have people who are trying to numb their pain. Why is that happening now more than ever? Why is it that since the late 90s, there have been this, there's been this huge spike in opioid-related deaths, and I should say cirrhosis of the liver caused by heavy drinking in white communities now, in white working class communities, much a huge spike since 1999, half a million excess deaths people who wouldn't have died if the death rates had stayed where they were. And all of a sudden after 99, there's this huge increase in that community in particular, white, middle-aged, non-college educated working class people who were dying from opiates, dying from heavy drinking or dying from suicide, right? Especially gun related suicide, 90% almost of all gun related suicides in the United States are by white men, right? White men killing themselves with, with, with guns. Now, I want you to think about those three things, opiates, heavy drinking, and, and suicide. Why would that group be the group that is having that increase? They're not the group that's hurting the most objectively. I'm not trying to downplay the pain there. And I'm just saying, like, if you look at unemployment, you look at poverty rates, you look at any level of, of well-being, any indicator that we use for, for well-being, people of color are, are in worse, worse shape on all of those categories. White folks are in better shape in all of those categories. And yet it's the white folks who are apparently not coping with the shape that they are in very well. And it's white folks who are disproportionately ending their lives either slowly with drugs and alcohol or dramatically and immediately with, with, a, with a handgun or something. 
as a result of not being able to cope with whatever setback they're having. What is that about? If it's not about being in worse shape, it must be about having not been, not had your promises fulfilled, right? If I tell you that's not going to happen to you, if I tell you, you play by the rules and do everything right, you won't experience that pain. You won't experience that insecurity. You won't experience that job loss. You'll always have health care. You'll always have a place to live. Everything will be fine. Again, the black and brown folks already knew that that was going to be a hustle and a grind, right? That that was going to take a lot of work and, and they couldn't take it for granted. But white folks could assume, hey, man, if I just work hard, my kids will be better off than I was because I was better off than my parents. That's never been the way that it's been for black and brown folks, but for white folks, it was. So if all of a sudden you make me that promise and you can't keep up your end of the bargain, I start to destroy myself. Why? Because the society tells me there's something wrong with me. So now I turn to these drugs and I turn to heavy drinking or I put a gun in my mouth and I end my life disproportionately. Interest convergence. We'd be better off. I'm talking now about white folks would be better off, healthier, and half a million or so might not have died who have died in the last 20 years or so if we had been questioning the society from the beginning. Because if we've been questioning the society, we wouldn't have blamed ourselves. Right? If we'd been questioning the culture, we wouldn't have taken it out on ourselves. We wouldn't have learned to hate ourselves, right? which is something black and brown folks have already been taught to do, and now white folks are being taught to do it too. Again, the great irony of it is that we have interest convergence. Uh, down the road from me is Vanderbilt University, and a friend of mine who's a, a scholar there, a teacher there, a professor named Jonathan Metzl, wrote this great book a, a couple years ago called Dying of Whiteness. And even though he didn't use the language of interest convergence that I'm using, it really speaks to that. He talks about going out and talking to white people in Tennessee, where we are, but also in Missouri and in Kansas. And he spoke with these folks about really three issues. Uh, one was education, the other was guns, and the third was, um, was health care. And he was asking them their opinions about these various issues and getting feedback and meeting with folks, like doing focus groups. And when he went to Missouri, uh, this was a few years back. He goes to Missouri and, um, and he's interviewing people there about guns. And he's meeting with, he was going to like um, sessions of parents who had lost loved ones to gun suicide. And these were almost all white families. They were all white families, actually. Because like I said, 90% of gun suicide deaths are white men. And these were people whose sons had committed suicide with a gun, a shotgun or a handgun. These were people whose husbands had committed suicide, whose brothers had committed suicide. Um, and he was talking to them about guns and gun availability and the gun culture that existed in the larger country, but especially in Missouri, and how that may have contributed to it. And just why did they want all these guns in the first place? What was their reason for having the guns? Um, and what he was finding, there's other research which has found the same, is that the desire for so many guns in this country, especially on the part of white Americans, has long been connected to the fear of the other, right? The fear of those people over there. So whether that was the fear of indigenous people against whom we had to arm ourselves, or whether that was the fear of black people that we needed to arm ourselves to protect ourselves from, or whatever it was, right? It was about arming ourselves to protect from them. And even now you'll hear people say, well, I need a gun to protect myself in case somebody breaks into my house and tries to hurt my family. Well, first of all, very few people get to use their guns to defend themselves from home invasions. They're, that just isn't happening every day. That's not actually a very common way that guns get used. But what does happen is if I fear those people are going to come into my house, which is what the research says we're afraid of. We're not afraid of, our, of other white people coming into our own. We're usually afraid of black and brown folks. That's what we've been encouraged to believe. So we're afraid of them. So we get all these guns and we make sure we're armed up to the teeth and we're ready. And by God, you're not going to mess with me. And then those folks ain't coming. Those folks ain't coming into our house. But now we got all these guns sitting around. And then if we lose our job or our marriage goes to, 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 to shit or whatever, and all of a sudden our life is falling apart, and now we got that gun in that drawer next to our bed, and we're depressed, and we're having a, a, an emotional breakdown, and now it becomes a lot easier to end our own life. That's what he found was happening in Missouri. You had this huge increase in gun ownership, especially after Ferguson, the, the uprising when Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson in St. Louis in, in 2014, right? You had this huge increase in, in gun ownership 
after that, you also had a significant increase in gun related suicides, almost all of them white men. So again, interest convergence, the irony being we're arming ourselves because we're afraid of those people and then we're actually the biggest danger to ourselves. We would be better off to not have that fear. We would be better off to challenge that thinking. He was talking to people here in Tennessee and he was talking to them about healthcare. And he goes out a few minutes outside of Nashville, he's sitting in a group, poor folk, working class, lower income white guys. He's talking to this one white guy who lives in subsidized housing. So he's living in like section eight subsidized housing, right? Government subsidized housing. He's talking to this young, well, not young, he's like 41 or whatever, younger than me, he's talking to this white dude, white dude's 41, 42 years old, has liver cancer, right? Is, is, is in really bad shape. And Jonathan is talking to him and he's like, well, do you have health care? And he says, no, I don't. And he's like, well, why don't you get on Obamacare at least? I mean, it's not perfect, but you could get on the Affordable Care Act and at least you'd have something and it would cover your pre-existing condition. And I mean, it's better than nothing. And this guy, this white guy responds by saying, I would rather die. I would rather die than be on Obamacare because that was created for welfare cheats and illegal immigrants. His words, not mine. That's who they made that for. And I don't want to be on a program that's for those people. And I don't want my tax dollars going to those people. Well, this dude doesn't pay any tax dollars, really. Certainly not income tax. He doesn't make enough money to pay income taxes. He's not, he's being paid. He, he, he's getting subsidized housing because he's struggling, but he doesn't want to contribute to other people who are struggling. And he thinks he's better than them. So he says, I'd rather die than be on a program connected to them. Okay, he's dead now. He died because he didn't get health care, because he wanted to remain separate and apart from those people. Do you see the, the interest convergence there, right? Like all of a sudden we're starting to see if we're willing to open our eyes and look that there are real costs that white folks are paying for indulging this nonsense, right? For indulging the racial bias that keeps us apart from one another and for indulging the mentality of rugged individualism that rationalizes all of it and indulging the inequality that sort of sets us up with expectations that can't always be fulfilled. And then when they're not, we don't know where to put the pain, right? So if we start talking in that way, if we create narratives of interest convergence, where we start asking white folks, not, hey, how can you get involved in helping to save black and brown people? Like it's some kind of charity thing, you know? But actually, how can you liberate yourself from this thing? Then we're on to something, right? I remember, and I'm gonna close here and then take questions. Um, I started thinking about this a long time ago when, when we came out of that David Duke experience in Louisiana and, and here you have this Nazi former Klan leader almost winning the U.S. Senate race. He got 60 percent of the white vote. The only reason he didn't win is black folks saved us in Louisiana from ourselves. And in 91, he ran for governor. And he didn't do quite as well overall, but he still got 55 percent. So he got the majority of the white vote, 55 out of 100 people. And when it was over with, I remember sitting there and me and some of my white colleagues and we're wondering like, what is this, what is the lesson here for us, right? And the lesson for me, as I said, like the only reason this Nazi was not the governor and the only reason he wasn't in Washington as a U.S. Senator is because black folks stopped us. If it were up to us as white people, he would have been in Washington or he would have been in Baton Rouge in the governor's mansion. Black folks saved us. And it's not black folks' job. And I would say it's not brown folks' job. It's not people of color's job to save white people from white supremacy, right? Ultimately, black and brown folks are going to liberate themselves. They're going to go out there and do what they have to do to stop this stuff from happening. That's what they did in 90 and 91 in Louisiana. That's what they're trying to do right now in the streets of this country, leading the racial justice uprising that we're in the middle of. The question for white people, and it's the question Derek Bell would want us to to ask. He's now passed, but if he were here, he'd want us to ask, is who's going to liberate white people from white supremacy? Who's going to liberate us from this mental mind trap that we have fallen into? Because it is costing us our lives now. As I said, the mouth of the river, everything flowing downstream poisons us all. Maybe not at the same time, maybe not in the same way, but eventually it gets all of us. So we have an interest in changing the way that we think. And so if we think these things through and we start doing truth and reconciliation and justice at a community level. We start doing critical autobiography at a personal level. And we start speaking of this as if our own lives are at stake, not as a charitable thing for somebody else, not I'm here to save you, but I'm here 
with you to save all of us, then I think we have the beginnings of and the structure of a real movement for liberation that can liberate us all. And I thank you all so much for having me. It has been an honor and a pleasure. I hope that sometime in the very near future, I can get to be with you in person. Uh, in the meantime, I want to take any questions that you might have. And again, I appreciate y'all uh, being with me today. Thank you. Tim, thanks so much. That was fantastic. We did have a bunch of questions come in. Uh, Tina has the first, Paula has the second. The first question came in was about uh, this Project 108, and we put in the chat what that was, but um, I was just going to do a 30-second summary and then ask what it was about that, because you got a, a long sheet about Sitka and, and jumped into that. So Project 108, there's a local decolonization discussion group. A lot of the people are on the call. And going into 2020, there was this realization that every 108 years is a historical time here. So in 1804, it was local people uh, courageously coming together to stand up to cannon fire in the Battle of Sick 1804. And then 108 years later, in 1912, it was the founders of the Alaska Native Brotherhood standing up this time for their civil rights. And so uh, 2020 is 108 years later. So what we're doing basically is making a time capsule for Sitkins in 2128. And the goal is to try to capture 108 stories from this year that are building towards a decolonized uh, Sitka. And so, for example, like this is one of them. Um, I think that I was in inspired by Tim's talk about a, a Truth and Justice Commission. If we start one of those this year, that's something that would go on the list. Um, when the assembly voted to move uh, a colonist statue, that went on the list. So you can check it out. Carrie Johnson, who's on the call, does a great job. She collects them. I think we're up to about number 71. So we need your help uh, to get to 108. But Tim, uh, the question for you is, um, and, and I think it kind of fits a lot of your discussion about history and understanding it. What was it that, that jumped out about that Project 108 for you? I just, for me, it was, it was that piece that I knew I wanted to talk about today about historical continuity. Because the other day when, when I read, um, you know, that, that the president had announced that he wanted to pull funding from any school that used the 1619 project that the New York Times had put together, uh, that Nicole Hannah Jones at the New York Times had put together, which was amazing scholarship. And and you know, look, there 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 are historians that argue about one or another specific in that series, but all real historians acknowledge the centrality of slavery and white supremacy to the American experiment, which is the first point that the project was trying to make. And then second, that black folks have been central to the furthering of democracy. Whatever democracy we have, we owe in large part to their efforts. And he's saying, well, no, 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 we don't, we're, anybody that uses this, we're going to pull funding. Now, he doesn't really have the authority to do that, to be honest. But that said, what that said to me was, again, we're in a country that wants to elevate historical amnesia to the level of a religious sacrament, right? That it is, that it is being elevated to this place where it's, it's considered a positive good to not really understand your history. So these people would rather have the George Washington chopped down the cherry tree and couldn't tell a lie version of American history, which is a fake story. It's actually a lie, which is the great irony of that story. They'd rather have that, right? They want that history rather than the truth. And so when I saw the, the information about the Project 108, to me, that spoke to a model, an example of a community saying, not only are we not going to run from our history, we're going to embrace this really important positive aspect of resistance. Because the important thing that 1619 Project does, it doesn't just, it's not just contrary to the criticism of it. People say, well, it's just, they're just tallying up all the horrible things about America. And they're saying America is this awful place filled with awful people. No, it's actually a project that says there's always been resistance to awfulness. It's not just the awfulness, it's the resistance to the awfulness. It's not just that black and brown folks had stuff done to them. Black and brown folks stood up and fought back. Well, that's what this project is doing too, right? It's saying this isn't just about all the awful stuff that happened. This is about what our people did in response to that. And that's an important piece of, of historical memory too. It's not just that people are acted upon, they have agency and they respond. And that's what I think, frankly, I think that's what scares the administration more than anything. I don't think it's just the, we don't want to talk about slavery. I think they really don't want to talk about the fact that black and brown folks fought back. They don't want people to know about that. They'd rather people be quiet. And I'm sure there are folks in Alaska and in Sitka in particular who really don't want people to know about, you know, the resistance of indigenous peoples. Um, I'm sure that there are people who are made nervous by that. And that's why it's so important. Great. Thank you, Tim. 
so the next question uh, came in and uh, Dr. Kraft shared this one. Uh, the question is, uh, Tim, what language should be used when having these uh, uh, conciliation or reconciliation conversations that limit the experience of shame for audience members? And is that possible? Um, I think the way that we limit shame is by acknowledging that it's a natural response to awareness of injustice. It's a very human response, you know, to feel guilt and shame when you learn for the first time that something that you have done or have been involved in has caused harm. It's not that it's a bad thing to feel. It's just a very bad rock upon which to build a house, right? Like it's a decent vacation destination. But if you stick around too long, you're going to sort of miss the real work, right? And so I think, you know, the good news about shame and guilt is that it's evidence that you are, um, that you have empathy or you have the capacity for empathy, right? Because if, if you didn't have any empathy, if you were purely sociopathic and unfeeling or a robot or something, you might not have the ability to care. And that would be worse. Like, I'm glad we're, I'm glad that humans have the capacity for empathy and thus shame and guilt. The problem is we get stuck in it. And so number one, let's acknowledge it's natural, but, and, and let's acknowledge that if you're feeling it, it the, in other words, I don't want to shame you for feeling shame. That would be weird, right? I don't want to make you feel bad for feeling shame, but I do want to suggest that it's, that it's debilitating because at some point it just becomes too heavy. And once, once I really started to think about my own interest in, in eradicating white supremacy, when I started to realize what it had done to myself and to my family, when I started to think about, um, I was thinking, I wrote about this in my memoir, my dad, who's uh, 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 for most of his professional life was an actor and a stand-up comic. And he, he made a living at those things, but he wasn't like super successful at them. So you would say like he didn't make it, quote unquote, even though he worked as a working comic for most of his life. Um, but I saw him descend into alcohol abuse and drug addiction and attempt suicide when I was 16 years old because his life was not living up to his expectations. Well, where were those expectations from? I mean, on the one hand, people put expectations on themselves, but he was white and he was male. And to be perfectly honest, as a Jewish white male in the world of comedy in the 60s and 70s, like, let's be honest with you, without over stereotyping my people, like there are a lot of Jewish folks in that industry at the time. And so he was being told in a million different ways he should make it. So as a white man, he wasn't making it as a, as a, as a white person, as a man and as a Jewish guy in a, in a relatively heavily Jewish dominated industry, not making it. I think that's implicated in his self-destructive activity. It's not the only thing, right? But it's implicated. Once I realized that, I'm fighting this for my people too, right? And I think that's where I move from the shame and guilt piece, which again is natural. Mm. That's what you elevate to a different level and you start thinking about this as self-preservation. And when it's self-preservation, you don't have time for guilt. You don't have time for the shame. You, you have to move to another place because the guilt and shame will just keep you stuck in a spiral where you can't even help yourself anymore. And so I think it's okay to start there and, and we want to let people know it's okay to start there. But if they understand the stake that they have and their own children have and their own community has, then I think they can move to a better, a better motivation. Yeah, fantastic. And looking at the clock, it's, it's funny. I'm going to give you this question with two minutes left. You may uh, chuckle, but the next question that came in is, is it possible to have capitalism without racism? Well, I've never seen capitalism without racism, so I don't know. I have to remain agnostic about that. Um, I, I think it is possible to have racism um, without capitalism, though. And so I'm always very, very cautious with my more like doctrinaire Marxist friends to suggest that ending capitalism or radically transforming it alone won't be enough to end racism. There's a lot of things other than just the class system which keep racism in place and white supremacy in place. And we literally don't have the time to go through what all those are. But I do think that the two things developed very much hand in glove in this country, as did patriarchy, right? So I think we, as did Christian hegemony. So I think we need to think about the way that all of these things, Christian hegemony on the one hand, capitalism on the other, white supremacy on the other, patriarchy on the other, how all of those things intersected and, and fed one another. Um, because you, you're not going to be able to pull out just one thread of the garment, right? You're going to have to pull on several and because they're all interconnected. And so we can't just fix racism 
we have to also fix the class system, gender repression, and, and, and religious uh, oppression as well, because they all inter intersect with one another and feed one another. And so I hope that we'll be active in all of them. If we're fighting racism, we need to have a, a good gender lens and a good class analysis and a good analysis around religion. If we're, if we're fighting for gender equity, we need to have a class analysis and a race analysis. If we're doing class work, we need a race analysis, race work, a class analysis, all of that. Um, because I think that work is, is too important for us to stay in our silos which is what I think we usually do, right? We have people who work on sex and gender, people who work on race, people who work on class, people who work on religion, and all of that stuff right now is, is coming to a head at the same time because they're all very much connected to each other. Yeah. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your uh, time. Uh, we're at our time tomorrow though for UAS staff, the all staff meeting is gonna have Tim. Uh, so people from Ketchikan and Sitka and Juno, if you work at UAS and then I know it's 12, some people are going to go, but I was going to end by uh, previewing the rest of the series. So if you have to go, uh, feel free to do that. But on Monday, we have Dr. Amir Ahmad, and he has a lunch and learn from 12 to 1. It's called Intercultural, uh, Cultivating Intercultural Leadership. Uh, so that's September 14th. You can see it on your screen. And then Hugh Vasquez is a week from today. It's another workshop. And it's creating conditions of equity across race, class, gender, and other cultural lenses. You can go to that same tiny URL to sign up for any of these. Then we have Megan Redshirt Shaw, an evening presentation. It's called We Are Still Here on Native Identity and Activism, September 21st. And then our own Dion Brady Howard, who has been an educator here for, for 20 years. A uh, hangout woman is going to do a, a keynote called Bringing It Home reflections on how to make community stronger. And then um, after that, on December the 2nd, a book that has a forward actually by Tim Wise. Uh, Dr. Annalise Singh is gonna be with us on December 2nd. The book is called The Racial Healing Handbook. We have copies at Old Harbor Books. So if you want to join the book club, uh, grab the book today. We're gonna have our kickoff in October, a midpoint on chapters one through five, and then we'll have the author uh, and again, uh, spay, uh, pay special attention to the forward by Tim Wise here, but grab your book today, Racial Healing Handbook at Old Harbor Books, and then we'll do a book club as a follow-up to the series. So lots of exciting things that are coming up. Thanks again to UAS. Thanks again to all of our sponsors. And uh, most of all, thanks to you, Tim. Uh, I got, it looks like about 10 pages of notes. Great. I'm excited. And Tim, I would not be surprised if we're able to report to you that by the end of the year, a local Truth and Justice Commission uh, comes about in Sitka. And, and so thanks for the inspiration. Uh, yeah. Thanks for this talk. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank and you, you can see Lakota's is adding some, some clapping there as well. So uh, if you want to some of you all tomorrow, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you at the next one.